This is part three in a series of videos in which I am attempting to repair two of these HP 9100B calculators. Uh, these are very interesting machines designed back in the 1960s. Um, they are uh, basically DTL machines, the diode transistor logic, uh, thousands of diodes, uh, about 750 transistors. Uh, not really any ICs in this at all. There are just a few, but not really in the uh, logic paths. The main ROM is a very interesting design that we'll have a look at in a future video. The microcode ROM is really uh, core rope memory, and the RAM is uh, just uh, standard core memory. I say standard, it was designed specifically for this, but it works in a very uh, similar way or identical way to normal core memory. And we'll look at that in detail in a future video. Now I've changed the a plan I had slightly for covering these. I was going to go through uh, the repair in sequence of uh, both of them. Uh, but uh, anyone that makes YouTube videos will know that sometimes trying to make a video make sense is quite difficult when you're dealing with something like this because a lot of the elements in this need explanation before you can really talk about the repairs. And I started videoing this and realized that a lot of what I was saying would only make sense to anyone that's worked on one of these. So although I've recorded quite a bit of footage of repairs for this, I'm going to kind of show this in reverse order. And um, what I'll do is I'll come back later with future videos and show what I found with this and the repairs I carried out. Uh, but we'll then go through in more detail uh, the repair of the other machine. Uh, but we'll use this as kind of a working example. and it, seem to make far more sense doing it that way uh, otherwise I'd be talking about things that um, just simply wouldn't make sense if you're not familiar with the inner workings of something like this which was kind of counterproductive. So if you bear with me uh, we will get back to the repairs on this and I will go into much more detail and we will cover every single board in this in a lot of detail. Uh, but what I've got to with this machine this is the second of the two that we tried in the previous video. This is the one that seemed to be working, uh, but unfortunately it wouldn't run properly. The card reader, there's a magnetic card reader on this that I hadn't mentioned. Um, that wouldn't work properly, and uh, when I tried to enter programs and run them, um, it just uh, crashed and the display went blank and it never came back. And uh, it did that whatever I tried to run, and also several of the keys didn't do what they were supposed to. Some keys were completely dead, the one key didn't do anything at all, and other keys just uh, tended to make the display go blank and, and not come back. So there was obviously something going on with that. And the approach I took to uh, dealing with this is I went through the power supply and um, found a few minor issues, mostly it was out of adjustment, so I set that up uh, correctly. I adjusted the controls on the CRT, that's mostly because, or well, the requirement for that is mostly because I'm running at 50 hertz here and I think the machine uh, was of course set up for 60. Uh, so the display was offset and distorted a bit. It still is distorted, but they do tend to be on these because of the nature of the uh, tube and the way it works, and there's no real correction. There is a way to correct it if you're interested that I'll go into in a future video. Um, but most of what was going on with this seemed to come down to memory issues. And the way that the RAM's organised in this is it's arranged into a series of registers. Each of those registers can contain up to 14 6-bit words, or 6-bit bytes, depending on how you look at it. And um, the way that the system operates is there is no programming language as such in this. So like with the 9830 you have BASIC and then you can uh, program it using BASIC. Although you can program this, you can't program it using a different language. All the programming really does is it stores effectively key presses. So if you want to store the value of pi, for example, then it would take maybe 10 um, program memory slots to store each of the effective key presses that you're typing in. So what it's really doing is it's kind of recording a macro uh, of key presses and then it plays that back as a program. You can save that to a uh, magnetic card, that's what we're going to look at here. Uh, but what I did is I went through each of the functions 
trying to figure out what was going on. So when you press a particular key, then it, cr it causes a, um, a function to be entered in the, uh, effectively in the ROM, and it uses the microcode to process that. So something was wrong in there somewhere. And uh, the way I go about fault finding on this, you can use a scope. A scope's not that easy to use for core memory because most of what the signals are that you're looking for are current signals. So they are uh, fairly short duration current spikes in various conductors. And in fact, if you look at these boards, you'll see these what appear to be wire jumpers. These are not just wire jumpers. These are actually current measurement loops that the manufacturer put here to allow this system to be uh, properly set up. There's a few on this board, there's some on this board. And uh, you can use those if you don't have a proper current probe, just wrap a few pieces of wire around this and you can attach that to a scope and then you can pick up um, the current. And they are key points, that's why they're there and it does make uh, fault finding much easier. It's We'll go into it once we look at the schematics, but it allows you to uh, see what the system is trying to do and allows you to capture data uh, and signals that are relevant to specific events. Now, I've got a bit of an advantage when I do this. I've got one of these. This is a, a current prober. It allows me to effectively measure um, signals in the uh, current domain going down PCB tracks. I can just put a tip onto a PCB track and then my scope will show the current uh, flowing through that track in real time. So it works up to about sort of four or five megahertz and down to DC. So this is extremely useful for working on core memory systems. Uh, and I'll show this in operation in a future video. So what I did with this machine is I went through, um, fixed all the faults that I could find and um, mostly what was wrong with it was um, there weren't really any failed components. It was, mo I, think I had two failed components, but most of it was down to either poor connections. One of the issues with this is these boards tend to wag about quite a bit. And because the top cover is often left unscrewed uh, in transit and there's the bounce around and these wag about and it opens up the contacts on the edge connector on the motherboard so they don't make proper contact. So most of the faults were just poor contacts to the motherboard, so I fixed that. Had a couple of uh, capacitors, there are some tantalum capacitors in this, so a couple of those uh, had gone short and they were on signal line, so I fixed those. And um, the rest of it didn't seem too bad. I haven't got it fully functional yet, but it's very close and I thought I'd uh, just quickly show um, basically how they are supposed to work in this video and then we can use this in a, as an example of what we're looking for when we come to repair the second machine. Uh, and again the reason I decided to do it this way rather than work you through the um, long-winded process of the repair is that you'd probably find the repairs a bit tedious and dull because I'd be talking about things that I hadn't really covered and uh, explained how they work and I can't explain how they work until I can show you it working so uh, it makes more sense to do it this way around but rest assured I will come back and cover everything in this in a lot of detail. So where we are at the moment is this will now load and run the diagnostic program. There is quite a good diagnostic program in the service manual for this and this is it. So this works in a fairly simplistic way. It's quite a lengthy program and um, what it does is it tests every single function within the calculator. And as I said, when you press a key, it actually triggers a function. Some keys trigger more complex functions than others. Um, but the way this works, to give some sort of example, is when you first um, start it running, um, the first thing it does is it effectively presses the clear key, and that clears the uh, registers, clears all registers, and the uh, XYZ registers uh, being cleared as well clears the display. The XY and Z registers are the three registers that are used for the display data. Uh, it then checks to see if the X and the Y register are the same. They should both of course be zero after the clear. And the way this uh, construct works in this calculator it says here if X equals Y. Now if that is true then 
it jumps to the address that's given in the next two um, byte values. In this case, it would jump to address 05, which is down here. If that is false, it does not jump to this address and it continues at the following instruction, which in this case is a stop instruction, which would stop the test. So it runs through all this, and they're all fairly similar. It runs through various tests and stops if it encounters a problem. But they are all effectively the same as pressing the key. So it's really what it's doing. It's going through and trying to run every function as if though you were doing it from the keyboard. But obviously it does it far more quickly. And then it shows that you the progress on the uh, display. Um, so for example, the next uh, step, 05, it checks as a flag in here that you can use to keep track of uh, the status of various operations. That should be cleared as well as part of the clear. So it checks to make sure that's clear. And uh, if it's not, then the test stops. If it is, then it sets the flag. And then it checks to make sure the flag is set. If it's not, it stops. If it is, it jumps to D. If uh, it gets this far, it effectively manually enters the value for pi. It's value for pi, so it's rounded. And it's doing, as you, as you can see, it's kind of doing this as if you were pressing the uh, numeric keys to enter the value. So it does that, and that value effectively is put into the X register. Whenever you type a value on the keyboard on this machine, it goes into the X register. So that's where it ends up here. And so this instruction, the up arrow, it effectively moves this value that's just been entered into the Y register. And it then effectively presses the Pi key, which is this key, you can't actually see it, it's a key with a Pi symbol on the keyboard. And uh, that loads the value of pi into the X register. So what we now have is the value that was typed in in the Y register and the value it stores internally as pi in the X register. And then it says here if X equals Y and they should of course be the same if all the keys including the pi load function were working. And if that's a success it jumps to 2.7 which is down here and if it's a failure, it stops. So you can see how this works. It just effectively goes through running lots of little test steps and that fully tests all the functions within the calculator. Some get more involved further on as it uses some of the higher level functions, but that's how the test um, uh, diagnostic program works. So we'll go through and we'll run that and see how close we're getting to a fully working machine. So I'll just... Uh, close the top of the calculator, disconnect all the test probes, and then we'll try running the diagnostic program and see how far through it gets. Okay, so we've got the machine set up and ready to run. As you can see, I haven't made any attempt to clean this yet. I've still got a lot of work to do. This was just really to try and get one of these ma machines working so that I could use it to demonstrate the functions that we are aiming to get working in the second machine and then we'll come back and look at the uh, faults I found in this one. So we'll power this up. Again, got CRT, so it'll take a few seconds to come to life if it's working. And the display is now on. So as you can see, I've got this set to floating point. Um, if you set it to fixed point and with the switch in the run position, uh, then we can use it almost like a standard calculator. So if we enter 45 and we want to add 12 and then we want to multiply that by 45, then you can see that this is working in much the same way as a standard calculator. You've got some reasonably powerful uh, operations here as well because you can move the values uh, around up and down through the various registers and um, you can swap them, so if you want to swap over uh, two of the values, if you want to swap X and Y for example, you can do that. If you want to enter pi into the X register uh, and then swap that with the um, value you have in the Y register, you can do that. And it gives you a lot of power to do some fairly, um, fairly basic uh, calculations, but you do have some high level functions um, over here. So for example, you've got cosine, sine, um, all log functions, tangents, all, all the things you'd expect on a normal uh, calculator. But bear in mind this was back in the 1960s, so this is quite uh, advanced for the time, even if we completely discount the programming. 
Uh, however, the programming is obviously what this uh, calculator is really all about. So the way the program uh, feature works, it's, as I say, it's just a series of registers. You can have up to about 190, I think it's 196 um, steps in the program. But bear in mind that um, a test step is just a slot within memory. So for example, entering this program, uh, entering each of the digits for pi is a test step in effect. So that takes up one of the slots. So um, entering a value of pi is not a single value. Uh, within the test step unless you use the pi key in which case you can enter the value of pi into the X register in a single step. Um, so the uh, way that you operate this is fairly straightforward. If you put it into run then the run is effectively allowing the uh, core processor to um, operate on the memory. In the program uh, setting it doesn't allow you to modify the program pointer directly um, but if you want to change the program counter to the beginning of the program put it into run make sure nothing's running and then go to whatever address you want to see if we then switch to program um, the bottom line the X register now shows us the current value and the address that we're at or address zero because we just reset it to zero and the Z register at the top shows us the value in the next register. So if we step through this program, you can see that there are values in here. If we want to enter a program, then we can just type in the values that we want. So if we go back to zero, uh, and we want to enter values, then if we hit the key we want to store as a test step, then the next one. So notice now that we are incrementing the address which is the number on the bottom left and the value of that address is on the bottom right. So I've entered the values uh, 1 upwards and if we now go back and examine what we've put in here notice that we are getting the values 1, 2, 3 that I typed in. So uh, that will now run as a pro or it would run as a program if it was a valid code. It's not, of course, it would probably just crash. Um, so what we can now do is enter the diagnostic program. Now the owner did send me a magnetic card with the diagnostic program on, and I've made a copy of that. I don't want to use his because um, these are relatively fragile, and um, we don't want to uh, do any harm to them. So we enter the card. Make sure we are at the address that we want to start loading from, which in this case is zero. We'll read the card, and if we just temporarily switch to program, we can see we are getting a valid reading in the Z register, which is what we'd expect for this particular program. Flip the card over, put it back in. This um, program is quite large, so it uses both sides of the card. We'll read the second side, and we now um, effectively have the program loaded. So if we go back to zero and we try to run this program, then what we should get on the display is this incrementing test sequence. So hopefully you can see it's counting up and it's going through all the individual test steps and that is the uh, value we should get on the uh, display. And this is now just uh, cycling around this uh, diagnostic program and that was this is the program we've just loaded from the magnetic card. If it encounters a problem with any of the functions within the calculator then it will just stop and um, so that we know where it's stopped if I artificially force it to stop by pressing the stop key then what we can do is look to see where it's stopped and um, if it does stop on its own, it will show us the value that uh, currently was in the registers when it uh, failed the test. So, in other words, it's um, quite a, an in-depth test that we're carrying out when we run this program. And that means that it's quite easy to properly diagnose the machine and figure out if it's working the way it's supposed to. And as you can see, this works just fine. I've left this running for an hour 
uh, already and it runs um, now without any issues. There still are some issues in this that I know about. It's still a bit too sensitive to mains uh, voltage changes. Um, works between about 240 and about 210, which is quite good, but um, I need to go a bit higher than that because I've got quite high mains voltage if I try and plug this into uh, the mains directly here. It does work, but it's a bit flaky on some operations, so I think there's um, some failing capacitors in the power supply and there's a bit too much ripple on the uh, DC rail. And this is one of the reasons that I'm showing this working first, because the power supply itself um, might be a bit unusual in terms of the voltages it puts out. It's not a 5 volt system. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the schematics that are provided by HP for this, they are a bit difficult to follow if you're not used to uh, transistor circuits like this, because it, they're effectively drawn upside down. And we'll look at what I mean by that in a future video. The um, Schematics drawn by Tony Jewell, who's done a lot of work on these, that's really helped a lot with uh, keeping these machines going. He's drawn them in a much more uh, understandable way, they're kind of the right way up. And uh, again, if you don't know what I mean by the right way up, I'll go into that uh, in a future video. But as you can see, this machine now appears to be fully functional. Um, as I say, I've spent some time um, playing with this, making sure all the functions work card reader wouldn't work properly and that was uh, again a fairly minor uh, issue. Um, but the machine that is this machine uh, we can now use as a test bed to uh, effectively run alongside the one that we are now going to uh, repair uh, on camera which is the second of these two. It's the first one I showed, the one with the big uh, feet and that doesn't really work at all it does show something on the display but it won't run anything so we'll use that as the first machine that I'll go through strip down and we'll repair and then I will come back and show you the videos for uh, what I found with this one but hopefully by then all the descriptions will make far more sense uh, comments welcome um, but hopefully uh, this should be quite an interesting series but it will be quite a long series of videos